Good evening, I'm Charlotte Cummins, Director of Education and Programs for the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation with Guan Yu Zhu and Paul Baker Prindle. This event is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Between, now on view in the Henry Street Gallery through February 27th. Between explores photography as a medium uniquely positioned for revealing the liminal. Defined in a multitude of ways, in between, a threshold, a moment of transition, or a rite of passage, the liminal provides moments of reflection on the past and potential for the future. Exhibitions in the Henry Street Gallery are generously funded through an endowment established by the Pleasant T. Rowland Foundation. We would like to extend our deep appreciation to the Board of Trustees, staff, volunteers, and our visitors for their support. We will start the evening off with each artist discussing their work before conversing with each other, followed by an audience question and answer. Please type your questions in the comment section and we will do our best to answer them at the end. We will start our evening off with Guan Yu Zhu. Guan Yu Zhu is currently based in Chicago and is a lecturer at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Influenced by the production of ideology in American visual culture and a conservative familial upbringing in China, Zhu's practice extends from examining the power, the production of power in photography to the question of personal freedom and its relationship to political regimes. His works have been exhibited and screened internationally, including the ICP Museum New York, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, New Orleans Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Photo Museum Winter There Switzerland, and others. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Guan Yu. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for the warm introduction. Um, and of course, thank you, Curator Mel, for including me in this show. Um, let me share my screen first. Um, so as you can see, here is a installation view um, at the uh, uh, Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. And I think the exhibition will open to February something. Um, and on the left, uh, you can see one of my piece from my series, Temporarily Censored Home. Um, so the photograph on view is called Facing North, Looking West, and it belongs to the project Temporarily Censored Home. Um, it is a project that I completed um, in 2018 and 2019. Um, in this project, I basically um, print out images that I made in um, the past few years in both US and um, different places um, in the world, I guess. And um, I print the images out and fold the images in my suitcase and then bring them back to my, uh, my home in Beijing, China, where I spent most of my teenage years um, before I eventually moved to the US um, to pursue my art degree. Um, so the, the project become this, um, it started with thinking about the space that I grew up that didn't really allow my own personal freedom, that didn't really allow to speak of my personal sexuality. And in a way, I use this gesture of um, layering images in space and then uh, to reclaim the space to be my own. Um, so the whole series has 15 photographs um, and 
um, they kind of deal with different space within the home. Um, and what you can see here um, is one of the image that combines four different elements of the um, of the images I, I brought back to, to China. Um, so some of the image in the installation are these family um, photo archives that um, I collected. And they are in a way to reveal my relationship with my parents. Um, so as you can see, um, so this is, um, you know, a little bit my background story. So as you can see, um, my, um, in one of the photo uh, in the center, right? Like it's uh, probably when I was four or five years old um, for a birth, for my birthday. And my mom um, is placing this military hat that belongs to my father onto my head. So from really early on, there's this uh, relationship between me and my parents that, but also their relationship towards the states, right? My father is a military researcher and my mom is a civil servant. So their relationship to the states are also consideration of my project, right? Like how they are kind of conservative um, ideology eventually um become something that that make me feel I cannot really come out to them. I cannot reveal my sexuality to them. Um, so another element of the work are of course these uh, tiny details, those still lives, those different objects that belongs to the space, belong to the apartment, right? For instance, what you can see here, um, if I go back to this image. Um, so in the foreground, you see this figurine of Chairman Mao, um, which is an object that um, usually placed upon um, the cabinet near our dining table. So if I zoom in. So that's where it usually placed that. So, um, Again, so I was also thinking about how um, different objects in our home or different object we uh, possess, how they define our ideology, how they define our desire. Um, but in this image, I placed the figurine to look at the suitcase um, and within the suitcase, this open suitcase, and you can see um, for photographs that I made in the US. So that, those photographs belongs to my previous project, One Land to Another. So in One Land to Another, I create a lot of self-portraiture with different gay men that I found in different places in the US. Um, and so I complete the photo, uh, complete the project in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. And then the, the project deal with my kind of intersectional experience um, that I felt as, you know, as a foreigner, as an Asian, um, and, but also deal with this lack of representation that we don't usually get to see in mainstream media, right? Like if we think about uh, gay characters in film or gay characters in um, general art scene, you don't really see Asian representation in those uh, in those industry. So, so that's what's really interesting to to think about. That I brought those images back to my home and eventually layering those portraiture with other men, right? Layering the interior space, those domestic space, dom uh, domestic space that I photographed with other men and collapsed with the interior space of my uh, childhood home. And eventually becomes this kind of uh, a new space, right? The different, um, 
the project that's about my intersectional experience in the U.S. suddenly functioned as something more subversive, more challenging in this more conservative um, household that still um, still doesn't know my sexuality. And the photograph, um, so for me, the project is not only thinking about, um, you know, reclaiming the space um, and create this maybe rebellious gesture towards space, right? Well, my parents are gone for work and I will put up this work, you know, I will take out the prints from my suitcase and put up those prints onto the space and eventually document the space um as as the final photograph you see now and then take off all the prints before my parents come back home so the, the project of course is about this um this frustration this anger this expressive gesture that i pursued in this space but it, of course it's also about looking at images and how we think about image right um, like I said, how previously made image from one land to another, those portraiture with other gay men, um, it function as something else, but suddenly it function as a more subver subversive um, object and subversive imagery in this space. Uh, for instance, this photograph I made in the parents' bedroom. Uh, and it's definitely one of the most anxious images that I, I uh, that I felt anxious when I made the image. Um, and just thinking about, you know, what if my parents suddenly came back from from work and saw the the portraiture become bed sheets on on their bed, um, and and that certainly create a new meaning um, through situate the, the image I made before, situate in a new, um, new space and create a new meaning. So that's, that's the most, um, that's another, I guess, important aspect for, for my work uh, about this project is to think about how do we um, consider image, how do we negotiate the meaning of image? Um, so another element that I included in the installation are uh, these magazine pages that, or magazines I collected um, since my um, teenage years. And they are these film magazines. So if I zoom in a little bit, um, I know it's probably not that clear, but you can still see um, like Clean Eastwood or the film Lincoln um, and uh, Wolverine and Captain America, right? Like there. So I was also considering how those um, interest for me, right? Like I, I collect those film magazine when I was teenage year and a, those um, film magazine about American movie really constructs a means, right? Constructs a desire for me to come here to pursue, you know, the so-called freedom and democracy. Um, but of course, they also embedded a certain um, desire towards, you know, what kind of face that's more represented in those mainstream media and how they construct a desire for me to 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 you know fall in love with so in a way the project also become um, this self-reflection about the, the production of power of image and how they construct my idea of the UIs. And eventually um, I juxtapose this image with um, photograph I made, right? Those photograph of portraiture uh, with different gay men and to deal with the lack of representation um, of Asian 
uh, and Asians. And so, so eventually the project become this convergence of space and time. Um, both pointing, you know, locating the viewer within this domestic space, right? But they also um, confuse the viewer um, and create different um, entry point, different window and different places for, for the viewer to enter into and point to um, this simultaneously um, I guess simultaneously existing moment of both um, the portrait I made, but also previously what I was looking at um, through the years. And I want to go back to the um, photograph that's on view I, um, at the museum. So facing north, looking west. Um, so for me, the project is also about creating this um, the feeling of disorientation, right? So in this photograph, if you were in the apartment, you will be physically facing north. Um, but at the same point, at the same moment, you are also looking at this landscape photograph that I made in um uh, in venice beach um california where um in a way i was looking at um so-called the west um you know towards the pacific ocean but actually at the same time if you are looking west at that moment you are actually also looking east right you are also looking at the direction of china so this kind of longing of home that's embedded in this um, landscape, but also it it is a, uh, a a contradictory, right? Like how can you be um, both looking east and looking west? Um, so for me, the work itself create this uh, dislocation, this displacement for the viewer, and eventually that also relates to the experience for a lot of marginalized people, right? Uh, when we uh, navigate in a public space, when we navigate in a space with majority of people that could be um, really, really uh, could be um, holding maybe grudge towards marginalized marginalized people, that experience of this disorientation, that experience of trying to fit our body in. Um, is also um, what I want to create um, that experience for the general viewer. Um, so for me, the work not only deal with, um, I guess the work for me, it helped me process the fear of um, revealing my sexuality within the space and it gave me a chance to generate a different experience for me to experience the apartment that i grew up in but it, of course it allows me to talk about this multiple um, um interconnected um words you know both the issue the conservative um experience in, in, in both US and China, um, but also thinking about the connection between my relationship towards my family towards and, and my family's relationship towards the state, um, towards the government, how, we, how I can bridge this um, narrative from a personal narrative towards a larger societal structure. Um, so, so here, um, I just want to, since I only have one or two minutes left, and I will just show you a um, couple more images. And of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to leave in the comments.
Great. And I will give the floor back to Charlotte. Guan Yu, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, and now I, I will introduce Paul. Um, Paul Baker Prindle. Photographs from Paul Baker Prindle's series, Momenti Mori, have been exhibited across the United States. His work has been published by Alt, The Advocate, and German Arts and Culture Magazine, Manar. A graduate of Edgewood College and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he lives and works in Long Beach, California. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. It's great to uh, be back with Amoka. Thanks to Mel and Christina for including me in this exhibition. Uh, just a couple notes. I'm I'm joining you from Long Beach, California, uh, at Pavunga, the traditional lands of the Hashiman and Tongva peoples. Um, and uh, for those of you that maybe are listening from the car or uh, live with visual impairments. Uh, I'm a man in his 40s. I have a beard, a buzz cut, and a blazer and button-down jacket on today. Um, I'm going to talk to you all just a little bit about my work uh, in the context of this exhibition. I'm really excited about uh, what um, Between offers us, and, and it's kind of exciting just how well uh, my work fits in this exhibition. So it's, it's uh, an honor to be among such a good group of photographers. So I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. Great. Okay. So um, I want to talk about my work in two different ways uh, with you. I want to talk about the role of the viewer, which I think um, makes a lot of sense in relationship to what we just heard Guan Yu talk about. And then I want to talk a little bit about memory. So this is the image that's in the exhibition. Uh, it's an exhibition of uh, uh, just middle class home, gray siding um, with some telephone poles and telephone wires next to a, a park. And I'm going to return to this. So I'm going to move forward um, to the next image. My work uh, is very much about the, the viewer. And um, that is indicated or signposted in my work in some important formal uh, means. So here in this image, like the other, there's always in this series in Memento Mori, um, these photographs of uh, sites across the United States where uh, individuals who are either thought to be or known to be gay, queer, trans have been murdered. Um, all of these photographs that I've been making since 2008, uh, over 80 of them now, uh, all have uh, a sort of stage-like foreground and then a closed off background uh, and often have a sort of proscenium or frame. Um, and I think what's so exciting to be talking alongside Guan Yu is that, um, and something I want to talk to him about, is I think that even though my work talks about hate crimes against LGBT people, I actually think what makes my work gay or maybe more correctly queer is not the content or the stories, but rather its emphasis on viewing, looking, cruising, observing. I think these are all visual behaviors that gays and queers organize a great deal of culture around. Um, but my research really got started, this interest in viewing really got started with a, a sort of um, maybe unexpected influence. So uh, it really begins with Bernini, who is this 17th century Italian artist who heavily um, guided the, the work of the Catholic Church to foreground um, faith and mystery and the ineffable, ineffable as a response to the more logic-based Protestant Reformation. Um, and so I want to just point out a few things and then draw some comparisons to the other uh, works in this series. So here we're looking at this church uh, chapel. It's called the Cornaro Chapel. It's in a church very close to Rome's uh, main train station. Uh, and it's one sort of side chapel in a larger church, the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria, and this is the Coronaro Chapel, and here, dead center, 
um, kind of on the stage is uh, center is a white sculptural arrangement of marble with St. Teresa of Avila um, floating on a cloud beneath uh, rays of, uh, of golden sun or sort of heavenly sun. Um, and there's an angel that is in mid um, gesture as the angel plunges a red hot arrow into um, the, the chest of St. Teresa. And she's wearing this um, kind of look of ecstasy or rapture. Uh, in fact, the sculpture is called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And what's really fascinating about this is on the side are two loges or kind of opera boxes where male members of the Cornaro family are seen looking on uh, to this scene. And then we, the viewer, um, are kind of sitting in the orchestra section watching this um, drama unfold. Um, and so that actual kind of uh, stage-like arrangement uh, plays out in all of the works in this because what I want to do is foreground the place of the viewer in in this case you know the person in the gallery who's standing before these um, 40 inch by 50 inch large uh, photographs um, the the role of the viewer is very much like the role of the viewer in the Exe of St. Teresa so you always see this sort of stage and backdrop drop um, here uh, this photograph of a children's playground outside of school in Queens New York is the site of Julio Rivera's murder um, in 1990. Uh, and I think what's um, important to, to point out, and, you, and you'll see it uh, time and time again, there's always like a little, um, maybe what Roland Barthes might call a punctum or like a little catch. Um, and, and here it's welcome, right? So this word that's printed in spray paint on the pavement of this, this uh, playground um, is a sort of uh, certainly a, a kind of contextual irony given what we know has happened here. And just like in the Coronaro Chapel, um, sometimes how you view the scene is, is sometimes from the side. And so here, back to the image that's on view in the gallery, um, the uh, this is Arthur Downey, um, a photograph I made in, in Maplewood, New Jersey. Um, you imagine yourself here looking at the scene from the side, just like the Coronari. And your role in, in entering this space, this viewing space is really critical to meaning making. Uh, and I think it's also really important to note that my images really are fairly mundane. They're they're not generally very, um, you know, they're not romantic, they're not emotional. I take them um, at times of the day where there's no sunset. Uh, it's, it could be a, a real estate photo on, on Redfin or, or Truly or something like that. Um, so here you have this kind of very mundane scene, but again, just like the welcome in Julio Rivera, um, here there's this blue fire hydrant. Uh, which I didn't even know fire hydrants uh, came in that color, uh, but you kind of get stuck on it. It's this little snag and it starts to draw you into the picture. And it kind of asks, it, I think it, it prompts you to ask like, what am I supposed to be seeing here? But the picture itself actually never resolves. It never does tell you what you're supposed to be seeing here. And I think that's the most important takeaway for me about this work in my practice in general is that photos don't do what they say they're doing or what we say they're doing. In fact, they do very little at all. And it's not until you have some context that you, you get to understand what is happening here. And a really important uh, tool at my disposal is, is the title. So I title these works with texts that are taken from um, interviews, police reports, uh, testimony, um, news reports, things like this. So uh, I want to give you a couple examples of, of how I think this works from um, examples outside of my practice. So here are two historical photos that I think work uh, well in illustrating my point. Um, you might be accustomed to seeing photos of this, like maybe on someone's grand piano in their their living rooms or domestic mundane photos that unless you know who the sitter is, doesn't really mean anything. So here on the right, um, there's this handsome young mustachioed gentleman with a thick mop of hair, um, a smart looking um, suit. And 
uh, unless I tell you who he is, uh, it's not really that meaningful of a photo. Um, but when I tell you that the man on the right is Joseph Stalin, the photo starts to mean something entirely different. And then of course on the left, here's this photo of a baby in a wicker velvet chair, cute enough, um, smart backdrop, cute little stockings. Um, that baby is Adolf Hitler. So photos, I would argue, really are a partnership and they require a viewer to make sense of them. And I think that doing so to make sense of photos really requires some sort of instruction. Um, so again, I think we, we believe that photos contain more than they do, but really they're, they're just screens onto which we, we project meaning. So um, one more photo, uh, I think for most people, maybe under the age of 30, this image probably means nothing. It's a photo of a car moving into a subgrade road with a line of concrete piers running down the middle. Um, probably for folks my age and over, this scene is actually an index or visual touch point for a certain Labor Day weekend in 1997 when Princess Diana uh, died in a car crash after the car she was in crashed into one of these piers. And we associate the memory um, of her death with this photo, despite the fact that this photo actually bears no indicators um, of what happened here, except I do think there is a sort of punctum. If you look um, kind of center or maybe center bottom right, there's a little pile of garbage and our mind immediately catches that and starts to imagine what has happened here. So here's a photo that I did make. Um, this is a photo that means really nothing to, to any of you, but it really is the key to understanding my practice. So the snapshot um, here I made on a film camera, just like the photographs from Memento Mori. Um, this is a photograph of the apartment I lived in as a student in Rome 19 years ago. And the bottom right on the front facade of this very typical Roman home with curved pediments uh, above the windows is the window uh, to my bedroom. Almost two decades ago, just as I was crossing the street to get to my apartment, I was struck by uh, a high-speed motorcycle and, and was nearly killed. Uh, I have no memories of the accident, uh, except for the smell of wet pavement and a feeling in my stomach that uh, I still get sometimes when I'm crossing the street. It took two years to recover, to make it out of a wheelchair, to walk again, uh, and to pull my life together after my uh, unsupportive parents found out I was gay and kicked me out of the house while still um, recovering. I returned to Rome a couple years later in hopes that visiting the spot of my accident would jog my memory because I really had no memory of this a massively traumatic event that my body was present for. And I know the memories are in my brain, but I can't get to them. Um, but when I went back to Rome, it, um, the visit really did nothing for me. So that was sort of a, 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 a genesis um, point of, of making this work. So here, when I tell you that Clinton Resetter died on this sidewalk just outside his bedroom door, after his neighbor walked into Clinton's house and set him on fire while he was taking an afternoon nap, this fairly innocuous kind of beautiful Santa Barbara apartment scene takes on a much darker meeting. And once I tell you what's happened here, you start to imagine this as a stage set, a scene where a drama has unfolded. And you imagine who's sitting in these uh, plastic lawn chairs. You imagine the breakfasts or maybe the cigarettes that were smoked at this table with the floral um, uh, uh, tablecloth and, and, a, and a pot of impatience. You note that this rhododendron has been cut uh, so that people um, can look out the window without um, their view being blocked. Um, and so I think I think I, I've, I've made my, my point, but what I want to emphasize is, is just how important um, the text that I introduce is to making these images work. And I think the fact that that's how it plays out um, demonstrates just how tricky photos are. Um, photographs, uh, scene after scene I photograph really fails to hold um, the memorial weight or any indication of what's happened here. Um, and I think even more so, there's a sort of brutality here in that um, 
we see that time just kind of carries on. Um, it moves on and, and there's no indication, sometimes even just two weeks after, after the, the crime has taken place. I'm just gonna cycle just through a couple uh, quickly here. I think even this very famous scene no longer means uh, quite the same as it once did. A new generation of people know nothing about Matthew Shepard or the meaning his death on the outskirts of Laramie has for millions of people. In fact, this famous landscape, this sort of windswept Wyoming rocky landscape with um, kind of scraggly pine trees and a, and a wood cattle fence, um, is, is also no longer known to a whole generation of people, but in fact, the landowner even moved the fence um, several hundred yards forward so that people wouldn't be able to access the site where Matthew was murdered. Um, so in this way, this scene that I photographed can't possibly be the most accurate representation of the site, but it doesn't really have to because after I tell you what has happened here, the image starts to take on the meaning that I want it to. So the last thing I really want to talk to you about is this, this notion of memory and how photographs have helped me to understand memory. So since working on this, I've learned that uh, memory is not at all what we think it is. Uh, even for those of us who are old enough to remember Matthew Shepard's death almost 23 years ago, our memory of that, just like the encounter with this image right now, is not at all what you think it is. So what we call memory is actually uh, an engram or a unit of cognitive information imprinted in the physical substance of the brain, um, just like a file is stored in a file cabinet. And um, further, what we call memory isn't actually real to the extent that when you remember, you aren't actually recalling the event as it was. You're remembering that, uh, that event. You're actually accessing that chemical signature in your brain um, through the lens of everything that has happened since and been networked to it in your brain. You remember um, things in a contemporary past, actually. Uh, our file cabinets are cross-referenced beyond our comprehension. And fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we live under the illusion that memories are authentic. But what we're actually doing uh, is creating uh, a contemporary past, and we do it in a way that feels very seamless and, and authentic. So in fact, the only real thing we can really be sure of uh, with these photographs, with, with any sort of memory uh, reference in a photograph is that um, the photographer, and in this case, um, me, um, at one time I stood as a visitor uh, to this site where someone was murdered. And in that moment, between when I click the shutter and the image is, is exposed and recorded on the negative, um, that's really the only real moment that can be recorded. Um, and it's the only concrete proof that I was there and that something mostly forgotten has happened. So this series emerged out of a need to sort out my own traumatic memories, as well as um, make sense of the, the graduate work I was doing with Tom Jones and Fran Myers at, at University of Wisconsin. Um, as I said, I've, I've been to almost 80 sites since I started working on this around 2008. Um, and something my grandmother said to me sticks with me uh, since. She, she would say to me quite often, um, the memory of you lives on as long as those who remember you live on. So, for me, making these images is a way of prolonging the memory of folks uh, that were murdered um, and deserve to be remembered, not only for their death, but just for the fact they lived, but also as martyrs for people all around the world that um, are just trying to live their lives authentically and truly. So what was taken away from them in that sort of razor thin space between life and death um, I can give back some time, I think, by telling you the stories 
that are indexed in, in these images um, by remembering them. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna uh, thank Charlotte once again and, and Guan Yu for um, being able to join you all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your work with us. Um, I will now turn it over to Guan Yu and Paul for a conversation about photography, the liminal, and their practice. Um, and as a reminder for our audience, please type your questions in the comments section and we will do our best to answer them at the end. Okay, Paul and Guan Yu. Uh, Guan Yu, what, do you have something on your mind? Um, I mean, I find it's really interesting. I mean, I, I'm just like trying to, uh, I mean, I feel like this is a more like a comment. Um, I like, I feel it's really interesting. Like I think about photograph in, I guess in space and you kind of think about photograph in relation to text and they kind of using text to reconsider the, um, to think about photograph more critically, right? Mm -hmm. And, but they also, you know, reveals that kind of contradictory um, nature of photography, right? Like how can photography um, represent truth and, and how much is fictional? And, and, and if, if um, and how, how the title of your pieces, they kind of generate, um, uh, generate a new meaning towards the photograph for for the viewer um and then eventually i guess for me as as an audience to look at those photographs um and suddenly after reading the titles after reading um i mean i guess the language they are all kind of different right i guess you mentioned some of they come from news and some is more from police or something um, so I guess the language is also different and, you know, the vocabulary that used in those um, titles could also shift how we identify um, all those signifiers within your photographs. I feel like that's really interesting to think about um, um, how, how there is, for me, a construction of, um, of narrative that's given to to the viewer to to decide mm -hmm. yeah thank you <laughs> um that that's a great um you know uh critique it's really spot on i i identify with a lot of what you're saying about it um i think that that's pretty spot on um and i i sort of wonder if in some ways uh we both are are doing some of that you know the the I guess I sort of wonder how you anticipate people kind of live in the rooms that you're documenting, um, and, and what and what degree to what degree you feel you have any control over that, um, if that if that makes sense. Um, I I guess I guess. Um, sorry, I'm just like thinking this comparatively. I don't really understand what you're talking about. Um, I feel like you as an artist, your control is the title, right? That's the anchor point for each photograph. Um, of course, you visit the, the site and then you, you know, you as a photographer, you decide this is the view you represent that site, right? Like you can, of course, shoot from the other you know, direction or show from, um, you know, at least four different directions that you can decide, um, but you, cho you chose one side, but eventually you also use text to, to anchor the, the meaning, right? But I guess for me, um, I was really trying to deciding, you know, cause I kind of create a framework already, right? Like my framework is uh, this apartment. And, and I decide what kind of, what categories of photographs I include, right? Like the photograph with other men, the photograph that I collected since uh, from those magazine pages and um, a photograph I took in different places in the US and Europe. 
um, and also the family photographs. And of course, what's already existing in the apartment. So for me, those are, uh, are kind of anchored, right? These categories, they are anchored. But of course, they, um, each of them, they also have a collection of images and they are all kind of representing like a different aspect of the category. Um, and eventually putting them together, it kind of generates this um, still, I guess, controlled and structured um, space. Um, but, but since the, the work um, is more fragmented and layered, um, so it also, I guess for me, to, it also gave the viewer um, a degree of freedom for them to access the information, even though, you know, usually they wouldn't have the information that we just, you know, talking about our artists talk, right? Like how they could, um, you know, in a way identify what's, what, what are the elements inside of those mm -hmm. um, space and how you can create um, a connection association through those images. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I. I think one of, one of the things I think a lot about is uh, a question that I got in grad school. Um, I was making portraits of friends and um, I remember being really irritated with a classmate who, um, you know, said, uh, I don't know what makes these images gay. And um, I think it pointed to something that I, is really difficult to describe, although much has been written about is like, um, you know, how gay folks, queer folks, LGBTQ uh, folks read things differently than, um, you know, cis straight folks. Um, and I wonder, how you negotiate or navigate um, how some people read your images versus maybe people in the community read, read in our communities read images because I think that's a really tricky thing for for artists uh, to 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 deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like you mentioned a little bit like earlier about your piece that um, you said like in terms of looking towards the landscape for gay people, right? Like that's, you know, kind of part of the cruising culture. It's also there, right? Finding this more isolated area. Um, and I feel like that's something, and of course, viewer all have their own right to interpret the work. And there's, some, of course, no, um, no control for artists eventually once the, the work is out there. And um, I, I guess for me, I was of course thinking about including those portraiture with other men. And uh, there's like a kind of, my friend made this joke that of course you can just show this image because your parents can just think about all those men, they are just your best friend and they are not, you are not gay together, right? <laughs> like, of course that could happen, but um i don't think so but still so like you the, the viewer has the power to decide that but i guess for me it's also you know like i said um uh, to think about the disorienting experience right like how um experience for marginalized people a lot of time you kind of question your own existence when you are around um people uh, when you are in certain space, right? Like for instance, if you um, go into a church, you have to behave certain way, right? If you go into um, a group of certain people, then you suddenly have to be really aware of your own existence and adjust, constantly adjusting that, that feeling is disorienting, right? So for me, it's also visually, I want to create something disorienting. I guess that's for me, that's, that's queer for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like I want to create something that's, um, that's you know, so-called now normal or like mm -hmm. unusual. So, so I feel like that's um, my, that's what, why I wanted to make a uh, disorienting. Thanks, thank you.
I would like to, um, I have some questions from the audience for both of you. And if we could spend the last bit of time answering those, it would be great. This has been an awesome experience with you both to have you here. Um, or let's see, question for Guan Yu. Your work is so deeply personal and you obviously have a career as an artist, but you mentioned that your parents aren't aware of your sexuality or presumably your art practice. Is there work that you do share with them? And does that mean that part of your art practice sort of lives in the closet? Does that inform your work in any way? Yes, um, I mean, as so far they haven't seen the work in at least not in person um, and they knew uh, a more low rise version of the work that's why they uh, because they find a um a article probably during the pandemic that's about my work um, but that's um, not an article but it's like exhibition um news so it doesn't really have much information about the show but only like installation shots and stuff so this happens so they don't actually know because the nature of my work they're kind of chaotic and you have to see it uh, in a larger image, so they still don't know what's actually in the photograph. Um, and yeah, so in a way it's still in, to them it's in, in closet. Um, and I definitely also created um, a kind of a new life. I gave a new life for this piece recently. So I printed the image onto shipping box and shipped a lot of my personal item back to China. Um, so I was thinking about um, how do I have the photograph exist, you know, in China in a more public space instead of in a uh, exhibition space. Um, so printing them in a shaping box, so they will go through custom. So custom have to, you know, all the custom officer have to decide what's going on with this box. And then the box is also going goes going to go through you know, the shipping company, so that will exist in public space. So I was thinking about that, but but even eventually the the work exists um, and and showed in the exhibition, uh, but also with the marks of transitioning, right? The tapes and how uh, custom make marks on the the the, the box and how the box. Um, handled by people. So it become kind of a little bit broken. So that was kind of a work in a real, in, in a way to think about sending my, myself back to home um, because I haven't been able to go back home because of pandemic and my visa set status. Um, so I haven't been able to go back home for, for three years. Um, so, and my, so the organization worked in China and it said, oh, we should just send this box back to your home after the show. And I was like, no, definitely no. I don't think I'm ready for that. Thank you. Um, Paul, a question for you. Would you consider your practice as a form of personal photojournalism? If not, where do you draw those differences in your practice working with a viewer in mind? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, the, I think the easy answer is I, I don't think of myself as a photojournalist. Um, maybe I should, but I, I'm not trained as a journalist and I, I don't really know anything more about journalism than I do from reading the paper. Uh, so, um, but no, I don't think of myself in that way. I don't think of myself as a documentarian, even though um, I was really influenced by the work of Alan Luft and by Tom Jones, who, and other, what I would call Wisconsin school photographers, where actually, you know, Johnny and Julie, um, there's just such an incredible legacy of, of dialogue with documentary photography. Um, but Ultimately, I think um, I, I just don't really believe the document in documentary holds up. Um, and uh, so I think I'm answering half your question, sorry. <laughs> but um, it's a really good question, but no, I, I think the answer is no. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Guan, uh, you go ahead. Wait. Oh, no, I was just saying, like, I really like how kind of investigative you, you, you were when you work on that project, right? Like, it, it feels like it, there were a lot of research 